Good afternoon and welcome to the Minnesota Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. Today is uh, Thursday, March 16, 2023. It is 1.14 p.m. Uh, members, we have uh, six bills on the agenda today. There are a large number of testifiers, just some sort of ground rules to open this up. Um, first of all, our intention is if we don't get through these bills today, to come back tonight at 5.30 p.m. and finish them up. Uh, we do have this room. Uh, of the test fires, I'm going to just sort of remind everyone in the room that I'll try to confine you to two minutes each. We don't put you on a stopwatch, um, but if you see me leaning in and sort of giving you the sign, it's time to wrap things up. Um, please try to get to the point and please try to not repeat uh, testimony that's already been delivered. Uh, and with that, we will begin with Senate File 2319, uh, Senator Fateh. Good afternoon, Senator Fateh. 2319 is before the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And with that, um, I'm members of the committee. I have uh, the A6 amendment. Senator Fateh offers the A6, and this is not an author's amendment. Can you please describe the amendment? Um, I would have, it was, a, it was a amendment that was um, agreed upon after having some discussions in labor last committee. I can have Stephen walk through it if you'd like as well. The, the uh, I'm sorry. Chair, uh, I'm sorry, uh, sir. Uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. My name is Stephen Cooper, and I'm an attorney that's been assisting uh, in this matter. The amendment is relatively modest. What it does is it reduces the amount of compensation the drivers will get from 255 to 190, and from 65 cents a uh, minute to 59 cents a minute. Uh, the other thing it does is takes out of the bill entirely any reference to package delivery. Uh, there were concerns by people like Federal Express and UPS and food uh, things that they were inadvertently coming under the bill. So that has been stripped from the bill and is no longer part of the bill. It never really was, but just in, a, in, in an abundance of caution. The other thing is the uh, Board of Directors has been, the language for that has been clarified. Uh, that is the Board of Directors for the Resource Center uh, has been clarified. Those. I'm trying to think. There may be another minor thing here or there, but those are essentially what the what the changes are. So they are not to uh, any of the issues that have to do with uh, commerce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cooper. And I, I made a mistake. Uh, Senator Fate does not offer the A6. Senator Seberger offers the A6. Members, do you have questions or discussion on the A6 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The A6 is adopted to your bill, Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Minnesota has long assured its workers of a safe and fair workplace. Um, it is something that we all enjoy the benefits of. Uh, but in the last decade, uh, a new industry has come into our state uh, that has circumvented nearly every one of these protections. And though uh, th that is TNCs. Um, more, most predominantly, it is Uber and Lyft. Um, they do not provide their drivers with compensation when injured. Uh, nor the vehicle used to transport customers. Um, they do, do not provide compensation for fuel uh, or any other equipment to conduct the business of transporting people. Everything is on the worker. Uh, additionally, they unilaterally change the compensation for drivers whenever they choose. Um, shifting the cost to the drivers, supporting the business leaves little compensation for their labor. Um, driving for Uber, Lyft, or other TNCs can be dangerous. Uh, customers can be drunk, using drugs, or engage in harassment, or create other difficulties. I personally have heard countless stories from drivers telling me of their experiences with riders that have attacked them, um, robbed them, uh, vomited in their vehicle, uh, and also stolen their vehicle. Um, they simply just want to feel safe while providing their service. Um, this bill sensibly remedies many of these problems, and with that, I'll pass it to the testifiers. Well, thank you, Senator Fate. And I'll uh, have the testifiers come up two at a time. Mr. Cooper, could you clear the table? And we will have Aid Ali and Abdullahi Abdi please come to the table. Mr. Ali, please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, my name is Eid Ali, and I am uh, uh, the president of Minnesota Uber and Lyft Drivers Association. Uh, uh, this is an organization that uh, organized uh, all of these drivers who are behind me uh, after we um, uh, kind of ended up um, um, 
just discussing about uh, the difficulties and the hardship that we were uh, having for the last 10 years that Uber and Lyft were out here. Uh, I myself, I am uh, a driver. I still drive for Uber and Lyft, and I've been driving since 2014. And uh, I am well familiar about the difficulties that we were uh, encountering uh, all of these time. And uh, today I uh, am uh, telling you that as a family guy who has five kids, that uh, what we have been going through in terms of safety, uh, in terms of compensation, and uh, in terms of getting fired without any reason uh, is something that is inhumane and something that uh, all of these drivers are, are coming here. Um, we don't make that much, but still, we're just trying to be uh, doing the best that we can so that we can feed our families. Uh, we're not asking any handouts. We are just trying to work as hard as we can and just provide some uh, uh, support or some uh, earnings uh, to our families. So uh, that is why you see this large number of drivers who are showing up today because of this is so dear to all of us. Again, I would like to say, um, uh, considering to this issue, which is very critical, uh, we want you each, uh, each one of you to uh, uh, pay attention and uh, um, take the, the, the proper consideration that all of these folks that are here uh, have families behind them and they need to feed them. And, and, and for that reason, we are asking you or requesting from you uh, to pass this motion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Ali. And I made a mistake. Could I have Mr. Cooper please return to the table? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My apologies. Introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, Stephen Cooper, and I've been assisting the, the MALDA on uh, proceeding with this. We have a couple of very important things. It was Pat mentioned in passing, but unlike almost any other business, the Uber drivers, the uh, Lyft drivers buy the cars. They pay for all the gasoline. They pay for the insurance. They pay for repairing the cars. They pay for everything. Uber only provides a path, Uber and Lyft only provide a platform. And the reason that is so devastating is when they first came here about nine years ago, they paid a lot more per mile and per, uh, per, per ride than they do now, dramatically more, two and a half times as much. As gas prices went up that are paid for by the drivers, they reduced the compensation for the drivers. Also concernful is they deactivate drivers without telling them why and without giving them an opportunity to be heard. But let me scurry to the issue that's before this, this panel, and that is the insurance. We have two provisions on the insurance. One has to do with providing insurance for the drivers, we have testimony from people who their husbands have been killed. We have testimony from people who themselves have been not, not able to work. They were seriously beaten. They were in the hospital for months. And then when they came back, Uber would not let them work anymore. So you bought the car, you made these big investments, and yet you get nothing. The families get nothing. And I think Uber will admit that. They pay nothing. Now, what this proposal suggests is that Uber provide for the drivers something equivalent of workers' compensation. Let me be clear there. We don't say it has to be workers' compensation. If they don't want to go that method, they don't have to. But they have to give protections. We have people who are, their lives are over economically because of the injuries. And one of the most dangerous jobs you could have right now is being a driver. As was said before, and there's so many people in the audience here who have been robbed, who have been beaten, who have been injured, who have been unable to work, some of them permanently. They get nothing. Absolutely nothing. Uber has known about this, and they'll say today, yeah, they get nothing. And then they've got a new argument, and the new argument is completely incorrect. They argue, well, if we were to do that, we'd lose our status as, uh, as our employees being independent contractors. Absolutely untrue. If you go to the, the labor and industry website, where they have the information about being uh, providing workers' compensation, it says right in it. Individuals who are independent contractors with, uh, with no employees are not covered by workers' compensation insurance unless the entity contacting, co contracting with the independent contractors uh, agrees to it. So that doesn't affect your, uh, uh, your independent contractor status. It says right in there it doesn't. And that's on Labor and Industries website. The second thing to look to is the bill itself. The bill itself specifically says just to quiet these concerns, it specifically says nothing in this statute affects whether somebody is or is not an independent contractor. The third thing is if you look at the criteria for independent contractor, absolutely none of them say a word about insurance. 
There's nothing in there, it would be absurd if it did. There'd be nothing in there that says you can't get insurance, you can't give insurance for injuries to your workers and still be an independent contractor. The reality is, and some of you probably know this from your own experience, because I know there's lots of people in the, in the Senate who are familiar with independent contractors. It's not unusual for companies to provide uh, workers' comp-like protection for their employees because it benefits both sides. It benefits both the company and it benefits the worker because you don't want to have people afraid to work for you. You don't want people concerned. One of the most concernful jobs you can have right now is being an Uber Lyft driver. Now, I've heard it said, well, that's not Uber or Lyft's fault. That's the fault of our society. That may be true, but who's most exposed to that? That's the problem. If you're going to be a firefighter, you didn't start the fire, but you have the risk of putting it out. If you're going to be an Uber or Lyft driver, you're seeing 18, 20 different riders a day. You're seeing thousands during your, during your time. And during that time, sooner or later, you know, when I was here the other day, uh, Two Uber drivers were beaten, their money taken, and their cars taken, and the thieves are clever. They take the first person's car, and they use his cell phone to call the second one. And then they take the cell phones, and they take the cars. There's been more incidents since then. This is a very simple request, two, two prongs to it. The first is for them to be compensated like any other worker in Minnesota would be compensated, not, not any more generous, not any less generous, but they have compensation for it. Let's go to the second provision. The second provision has to do with the, the regular insurance, and that's car insurance. And Uber says, oh, we have $1.5 million of insurance. Well, that's because you require it, but they don't pay a penny of it. The statute says it can either be the driver or the company. What we're saying is it should be the company. All of the insurance for third parties, uh, for people in accidents, if, you, if, you know, if, if there's a pedestrian hit, if there's a car crash and somebody's injured, that is all on the shoulders of the drivers. The company contributes nothing to that. So when they brag, oh, we have 1.5 million, no, you don't. The drivers do. And that's a tremendous expense. When you start adding up, and I, as I was saying before, paying for all the fuel, paying for all the insurance, buying the cars, all of those things, the amount the drivers are actually making from the amount they're getting is very dramatically much less than that. That's probably my two minutes, so, so I'll, I'll stop unless there's a question. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And if I could have the two of you clear the table and make room for Mr. Abdi and Ms. Brown. Mr. Abdi, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself, please, and proceed. Uh, my name is Abdullahi Abdi, and I'm going to be the translator today, and my name is again Eid Ali. Uh, I drive for Uber and Lyft. Uh, I, I give a ride uh, to about 14,000 uh, folks for Uber and uh, Lyft and about 4,000 for Lyft. Uh, uh, August 20, uh, 21, um, uh, it was a night time when I just gave a ride to a passenger uh, somewhere from Ramsey County. And uh, the passenger that I was transporting at the time tried to rob me and get my phone. And uh, as a result of that, this is what has happened. Uh, the, the bloody shirt that I'm wearing is the one that I was wearing at the time. <laughs> And uh, the, the trip was only four dollar one uh, that cost me to this. At the time I was driving for Uber, so until today I didn't hear anything from them. They didn't um, uh, support me. They didn't talk to me about it, and they didn't even pay my uh, uh, medical bills. Ramsey, Ramsey. 
kedimna en ninki idley wala si daay ramz kaam dibi kaan laba laba arimo baayku daalay midu wa mid uber oo um uh the uh ramsey county uh got the criminal they apprehended him and uh now i would like to tell you that i have two problems that i got uh, the first one is that i didn't get any compensation from uber وقلب لبعض دولة دي يا رمزي كاوندي أو اللي يقول دلي نكي كريم نالك أنا ويسي داين أنا أنا هو حقوق أو اللي يجس يوحترو اللي يجو ويدين كأن لسي داين من المجرين. And the second thing is that the 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 criminal that was apprehended by Ramsey County was released and I wasn't even contacted about it and I didn't get any compensation from Ramsey County and the government in general as well. Police kau ni hilir leh, siapa yang ikut kis kaki orang kau ni di Ramsey County, Siti kau ni di Ibu Ur. And the police that was having that case in their hand said that we transfer your issue to the county. Lepas tu, garden kami dah muka tu, dah ibu ya lagi gas, di kiri kiri ibu dalam itu kau angkau. And uh, what happened is something that you guys can see. It 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 speaks by itself. This is the shirt that I was wearing at the time. أنا بقول درد وحن جوي أقل قريب ذيك إن كملوا أقل كسرعة درد. Two days ago I was also testifying at the other house. شلا إنه وحن جوي أقل كهوس أو قريب كهوس ذيك إن كملوا. And also a couple of days ago I was also testifying on the same issue in another house. ما أنت إنه وحن إذا هرب ديا إذا إنك أو قريب يعني حلبان ذي عن صادور تكملوا. And today is your turn, man. That's why I'm testifying in front of you because of you are the elected officials that I voted for. I need justice, and thank you so much. Well, thank you, sir. Ms. Brown, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Mariana Brown. I'm driving for Uber and Lyft for over six, almost six years. I have almost 6,000 trips, good rating, good can acceptance and cancellation rate. But there's so much issue that's there, but I just want to address one. Um, recently, Uber sent a letter to us that we are not allowed to take any kids, any minor under the age of 18. We're supposed to ask for ID if they don't look like the age of 18. But on a daily basis, you get at least 10 trips from an high school from a minor. We go there to pick up these minors. They're under 18, we have to cancel, we don't get paid to go there. And these minors, they're very rude. One try to break my mirror off my car, kick my car, tell me to come out, they wanna fight me. And all that because I have to cancel. And I explain to them, this is Uber rule. The last time I went to pick up, I have Uber on the phone before I go because it was a high school. I said, I want you on the phone to see what we go through. And they're trying to explain to them, they're on the phone, well, we called, give me back my money. I said, I don't have your money. Oh, come on, we're going to fight you. We're going to beat you today. But I said, why are you fighting me? I'm doing my job, what I was told to do. So at the same time, we're put at risk with these minors. They send these, these re requests to us. We can't pick minors. But at the same time, minors have an account. And when we go to pick them up, they say, oh, our mother called you, but I say, your mother is not there. We were told that you have to be 18. Provide me my ID. Oh, my ID is in the mail, but I said, I can't take you. And it requests so much problem for us because our we have safety problem because these are the kids that cause the problem. The adults most cause problem, but these kids, when you go to pick them up, they get frustrated. And our lives is at risk because they threaten us to fight us, to beat us. I'm almost 60 years old, so how am I going to find with that kid? And it's kind of hard. So our safety is at risk. And every time someone is as urged, Uber will come in with their lawyers and say, oh, we compensate you, but have they ever talked to one of the people that was hurt to find out to them how they are and to see what step need to be taken? And we testify and they have their lawyers coming and their people coming, but they never reach out to one of the people to talk to them, how are you, how are you doing, and help me, help me help you. But nobody comes, so when we come out now and we're trying to do our best to get some rule into place, some law into place. They come out and send the lawyers, spend all the money, but we making the money, and we are there night and day putting our life at risk. We don't know if we'll make it home because sometimes we have some unruly passengers. So what are we supposed to do at this point? We're not making enough to put our lives at risk. 
And it's kind of hard. So I ask you to put this bill through because we're scared sometimes. Sometimes I pick up some people with some big things. I pick up this guy with the thing and I say, what do you have in there? He says, a pool stick. I said, let me see it because it looks like a gun in the case. We don't know, but we're scared. And I'm a woman and I'm scared and I think I'm bold, but I'm still okay when I see certain circumstances. So I ask you to put this bill through and we have a safety problem and we need to address it also. Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. Okay. Could I have roommate at the table for Mr. Castaneda and Mr. Awil Shire? Welcome to the committee, Mr. Castaneda. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yes, my name is Mauricio R. Castaneda. Um, good evening, guys. Uh, the uh, reason why I'm over here is because um, um, uh, you know, uh, this is kind of, you know, sad because, you know, before, you know, I was making money and now, you know, I, I don't make that much money, you know, Uber and Lyft taking so much percentage on the on those rights, you know, and also we got the crime behind us. Trying to work at least 12 hours a day, you know, I start very early in the morning, trying to make some money, you know, to bring home and feed our kids. Uh, my wife can't work because taking care of my kids, you know, and got so many bills to, to pay but I cannot afford it anymore because I cannot make any money. Uh, day per day, you know, trying to make at least $200, but I can because the rice are six, $7, $8, you know, how we cannot survive with that money, you know? We can't survive with that money. Also, you know, we spend gasoline uh, insurance car payments, uh, rent, you know, so it's so a struggle for me, you know, to survive right now. So before, to be honest, we was making money, you know, like four or five years ago when I started, I started uh, nine years ago with Uber and Lyft and I was making money, you know, decent money, but not, not anymore, you know, and this recession, you know, everything is expensive. And they, they think, you know, we, we have to put everything in, on the table. You know, we have to put insurance, we have to put uh, gasoline, we have to uh, put everything, you know, with maintenance on the cars. Everything is expensive right now, you know. Three days ago, I went to, to the dealerships and they, they told me, you know, I have to pay for my tires, $1,300. And I say, I can't, I don't have that much money. So I went to Costco and I got deals, you know. I got it for $800, $800 for the four tires. And, you know, try to, you know, take some money from, from this side, from the other side, you know, because I want to pay this bill, I want to pay, I want to close this hole, I want to close the other hole. And, and it's, it's kind of frustrating, very frustrating, you know. And, well, thank you guys to let me talk. And, you know, I hope you guys understand my English. That's a little bit tough. And I don't talk with, in front of the public, and it's kind of nervous. But thank you for let me talk. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Castaneda. You did great. Could you make room at the table for Mr. Joel Carlson? Mr. Shire, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you. Uh, my name is Awil Shire. I'm a president of uh, Minnesota Ratio Driver Association and I'm one of them of uh, Uber drivers. I uh, was founded 2020 murder the COVID-19 pandemics registered with the state in 2022, organization created by let share, let share drivers and community leaders. Murder supports the intent of, of the Peel House HF 202369 and Senate SF 2319, but against most of the content of the Peel, such as the Peel, does not pass the litmus test of the independent contractor. Law is our highest and priority is the flexibility and the freedom of the driving as their time permits. 
as a writing, uh, second, as a writing, the bill will quadruple the cost of the service to the riders. This will be reduce riders' middle and lower economic classes substantially in return we will have no business. There, there are no enough protection for the drivers. Most of, our, most of our drivers, they work seven days a week, more than 10 hours a day to make ends meet. We wanted to a makeable bill for both riders and the drivers. Uber and Lyft make their profit by connecting the driver and the, and their, and, and the rider. The two major stakeholders are drivers and the customers. We propose to common sense a solution that can make driver five, work five days to make livable income while customer can afford the service. Current situation, one of uh, the current situation, number one, minimum per mile, 0 0.3, 0, 0 0.83. Second, minimum per minute, 0 0.17. Cancellation fee, $5. No occupational and not clear insurance. No clear driver's grievance and process when deactivated. Proposed bill, minimum per mile, 255. Minimum per minute, 0 0.65. Cancellation fee, $10. Per mile maintenance, 0 0.30. Dollar 25 per mile and 20 cents per minute if a driver must drive more than five miles to pick up. Three is further than five miles. Additional mile per mile, 120, not clear. As also a murder solution, minimum per mile, 150. Minimum per minute, 0 0.2, 0 0.34. Cancellation fee, 750. Insurance, 1 million occupational insurance to cover in customer hours in the driver. Establish the deactivation appeals process that are clearly defined and the drivers can consent. Second, locally acceptable, uh, accessible venue to process drivers concerning that are different than green light. And also, we need to earn more than cover our own expenses. Independent contractor, 12 years. The people who drive the black Uber, they just have five years only to drive their cars. It's a really, really brand new cars, but they have some little match. They have to get, after five years, new one. We need to add it in two half years to keep their cars working with these people. And also, uh, as you face people and the people who is uh, driving those cars, they need protection. And we as a murder, we support all our driver. I'm our driver. I, am, I just want rights for all the drivers. Uber and Lyft, they are big companies, but the money we're taking, it came from the customer. If we raise the money, Uber and Lyft, they will raise their percentage. But what about the customer? We don't look even. And the drivers, they need to get something economical and work for them and not hurt the customer. And also, this bill I see somewhere, we are a murder. We have a different organization for drivers. There's 9,000 drivers in Twin City. And we also have a cable different organization. We would like to work all of them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Shire. And could you make room at the table for Mr. Freddie Goldstein? <coughs> for Ms. Freddie Goldstein. Uh, Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, uh, maybe uh, uh, Ms. Goldstein can go first. She's here on behalf of Uber, and then I'll follow her. Ms. Goldstein, please introduce yourself for the record, and welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Chairman Klein, Vice Chair Seeberger, and members of the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. My name is Freddie Goldstein, and I'm here on behalf of Uber. Um, I want to first just recognize the testimony from the drivers that came before me today. It's obvious that there's more that we can and must do. Um, I took over policy for Minnesota in December, and this is my fifth time here since I took on this new role. Um, I've been meeting with drivers. I've met with many of the drivers in the room today at a town hall back in January, um, and my plan and goal is to continue to meet with drivers, hoping that we can find some common ground here. Um, put plainly, SF2319 will hurt drivers, riders, um, and the Minnesota businesses that rely on these services. If passed in its current form, the bill would make Minneapolis the most expensive city for rideshare in the country. For example, taking an Uber ride in Minneapolis would be about 50% more expensive than the same trip in New York City. We estimate that the cost of rides will increase more than two and a half times on average and more than four and a half times on some trips. These are not just numbers, they have real world consequences. With such a steep increase in costs, 
Even in the best case scenario, we will see a decline in demand for these services. Our calculations show a decrease in rideshare trips by 65 to 75 percent. This reduced demand means less work for drivers. We estimate that we can reasonably anticipate around 7,000 drivers will leave the platform. An unfortunate reality is that demand will especially decrease in lower income communities, leading to decreased transportation options in less dense and less well-connected areas. With such a loss in both supply and demand, we will unfortunately have no choice but to stop operating entirely in some parts of the state. In the areas where rideshare continues, consumers will see much higher wait times in addition to much higher prices. On the insurance piece, while the bill is light on specifics, the position of requiring workers' compensation insurance puts Minnesota out of step with the rest of the country. Only one other state requires TNCs to maintain workers' compensation insurance on behalf of TNC drivers, and even then, only once a trip has been accepted. The point of our platform is that people can turn on the app at any time, whether they intend to actually accept jobs or are just trying to see what the market looks like at that time. When a driver has the app on but is not actually engaged in a trip, they are no different than any other driver on the road. Requiring rideshare companies to provide workers' compensation insurance coverage for drivers who are not actively working on the platform is antithetical to the purpose of the coverage and could unfortunately increase the likelihood of fraud. Setting aside workers' compensation insurance, setting that aside, workers' compensation insurance is not the appropriate first-party injury protection insurance for independent contractors. Instead, occupational accident insurance has been proven to provide benefits akin to workers' compensation while retaining the flexibility to design a program specific to the wants and needs of independent contractors. That is something I suggest we explore. We care deeply about our work in Minnesota and know that drivers are central to our success as a platform. We understand that drivers want predictable pay, greater pay transparency, and a process on deactivation appeals, among other things. As I mentioned, since December, I have been in active conversations with drivers to deliver on these things in a way that also protects their status as independent contractors, something drivers across the country say is critical to why they do this work. With this testimony, I respectfully ask that the committee reconsider moving forward with the bill, recognizing it creates a number of unintended consequences. Instead, we ask for the opportunity to come to an agreement with rideshare drivers. It is our strong belief that we can work together on a solution that is fair to drivers and riders without putting the future of rideshare in, in Minnesota at risk. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Goldstein. Mr. Carlson, introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Joel Carlson, I'm here on behalf of uh, Uber Technologies, a company that I've represented since there was Uber in Minnesota. I've represented them since uh, 2012, and Minnesota has a unique uh, a regulatory system for these companies. We are regulated at the local level. We do not have a statewide policy that regulates TNCs. We have an insurance requirement in 65B that puts uh, insurance requirements on both drivers and the TNC companies. Um, and this bill, I think, not only eliminates that uh, uh, in a problematic way, um, it um, um, by I'll just walk through it, Mr. Chairman. But but just so you know, local government regulates these businesses, not the state. Uh, that's not true across the country. Uh, and, uh, um, and so this is a move in a direction that I think is a very big expanse for us that is going to take some time to work through. And I think we can work through it. But let me just talk to the bill, Mr. Chairman and members. On the insurance question, on page uh, two of the bill, on uh, 2.10 and 2.11, the bill requires us to provide equal to what is provided under workers' compensation. I have no idea what that is. There is no such product available. Minnesota doesn't offer such a product. We, in fact, are one of the 10 states that don't allow occupational uh, accident insurance to be offered in our state. So you're asking us to provide a coverage that is not available in the state, and you are adding, in our, that means we have to provide workers' compensation coverage. That would mean that we would have to have thousands of people now covered by workers' compensation every time they turn on their app, and we think that's unfair. Mr. Chairman um, uh, and members, I would also note in the uh, A6 amendment, uh, they deleted uh, lines 2.15, 2.16, and 
That is the reference to our existing insurance requirements in 65B. So I don't know how those um, interact any longer with this new bill. At a minimum, we have to buy two levels of insurance now uh, because we're not doing anything in 65B to adjust for the changes in this bill. So there's a, a real conflict there that I hope the committee uh, will dig into. Um, I have also, I disagree with much of what Mr. Cooper said, but I completely disagree with him uh, that this doesn't impact the laws it relates to these drivers being independent contractors. And I can tell you through all the work with uh, uh, these drivers, they want their freedom, they want their independence, they want to work when they want to work. But Mr. Chairman and members, our independent contractor status for these drivers is governed by Minnesota Statute 176043. And for us to classify these uh, drivers as independent, each of these factors must be present. And those factors include them controlling the work, them individually doing the work. But on paragraph three of that, the individual responsible for must be responsible for the operating costs, including fuel, repairs, supplies, vehicle insurance, and personal expenses. On 2.6, uh, it requires us to provide uh, uh, insurance for their injuries, which we do provide. Uh, on 2.12, it requires us to provide insurance for their vehicle, for uh, damage to their vehicle. Just on that one alone, they have to meet each of these tests, and they no longer do. Uh, on 3.10 and 3.12 and 3.15, it requires us to reimburse them, unlike any other state in the country, for their, um, uh, for their fuel and the wear and tear on their maintenance of their vehicle. That is not required anywhere in the country and does no longer make them an independent contractor. And the last thing on independent contractor status on item five, they cannot be paid on the basis of hour or time. And if you look at the bill on line 2.22, uh, they are paid by minute for each trip. That takes them out of independent contractor status. And so this bill, if they want to move forward with it, we need to have clarity because it doesn't matter what this bill says. These are the tests. And unless you change them and we have to compensate drivers under this framework, they no longer meet the test of independent contractors. One last uh, part of the bill, Mr. Chairman, I want you to uh, consider, and that's the board that is created both in the bill and in part of the A6 amendment. They are now creating a state board where the appointed members uh, get paid $250 a day that Uber and Lyft pay for by an assessment on their services. Um, and the appointees to that include the Attorney General, the AFL-CIO, my friends at the Teamsters, and the uh, Uber Driver Association that's bringing this bill forward. This, this group is going to set the working conditions for TNC drivers, yet there is not a single representative on this board from the companies that are actually working and providing the service. I think that's just a, a significant flaw that somehow needs to be addressed. I think there are better ways to go about driver complaints and deactivations, and we've been working on those for months. This is just not the way to do it. This bill has a lot of issues, Mr. Chair. I hope that the committee will consider them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Could I have Jill Sims and Andrew Carlson come to the table? Ms. Sims, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Jill Sims. I'm the Director of Government Relations at Hospitality Minnesota. We represent Minnesota's restaurants and food service, lodging, resort, and campground sectors. We appreciate Senator Fate's consideration for the impact of food delivery in Senate File 2319 after last week's hearing. We support the portion of the amendment removing packages and delivery, as this will clear up quite a bit of confusion for many industries, in particular for food service and restaurants. However, we ask for the author and committee's consideration for the larger impact on tourism and the hospitality industry when it comes to ride pricing. As drafted, the price of rideshare would increase significantly, with some rideshare companies suggesting that Minnesota would become the highest priced state in the country for rideshare. 
Many of our employees depend on rideshare services to get to and from work, especially with challenges to the public transportation system from safety to weather. Plus, many of our businesses um, operate on extended hours where public transportation might not be available and rideshare use may be required for some employees. Let me give you an example. A female working in an uptown restaurant that maybe closes close to midnight with the uptown transit station now closed um, might not feel comfortable waiting um, or safe. So they're gonna use those earnings to take that ride share home. And our businesses are very, very concerned about the, impa the impact the potential cost is gonna have to the, their employees. Additionally, many of our residents and visitors rely on ride share services to and from restaurants, hotels, <coughs> entertainment venues, and more. So as we consider um, putting increased investments in tourism and attracting large-scale meetings and events to Minnesota to help our hospitality and tourism businesses recover, the meeting and event planners um, evaluate those costs on a holistic perspective when they're choosing the different cities that they may go to. So we don't want to discourage visitors or events and meetings based on the fact that our market costs are extremely high. Um, this is a vital Bringing those events is vital to the constituency of all of our businesses here, the rideshare drivers, the restaurants, hotels, entertainment um, venues. So we're happy to be a resource. We'd like to work with the author and committee members going forward to just ensure that the entire ecosystem that this will be impacting is considered. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sims. Could you make room at the table, please, for Mr. Aaron Cocking? Mr. Carlson, please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chairman Klein and members of the Senate Commerce Committee. My name is Andrew Carlson with Larkin Hoffman, here testifying on behalf of Lyft. Lyft supports a policy proposal that guarantees driver independence and flexibility combined with an earnings floor and basic protections. But it's important that we do so in an objective, data-driven way that doesn't sacrifice rider affordability or jeopardize earning opportunities for drivers. Lyft has supported legislation to this effect across the country. For example, in March of 2022, following uh, collaboration with organized labor in Washington state, Lyft was proud to support HB 2076. This first in the nation legislation preserved the flexibility and independence workers in today's economy need while ensuring new benefits for drivers, including an earnings floor paid sick time, and on-the-job injury insurance. Lyft is committed to engagement that results in responsible and workable laws to benefit drivers. However, Lyft is opposed to this bill because it is detrimental to both the industry, drivers, and riders. Senate File 2319 will increase the average ride fare more than three times, and will result in fares three to four times more expensive than taxis. So for example, under the bill, a trip from the Capitol, from here at the Capitol to the airport, will go from around $19 to $64. Rideshare is a critical component of Minnesota's transportation infrastructure, with 60% of Lyft rides starting or ending in low-income areas. However, this bill would turn rideshare into a luxury that only wealthy Minnesotans could afford. Rideshare also provides tens of thousands of people in Minnesota with an important earning opportunity. Minnesota drivers during the third quarter of 2022 were earning on average $35 per utilized hour. This does include tips and bonuses. This reflects a 6% increase year over year. This bill will increase ride fares so dramatically that it will decrease the overall number of rides a driver can give, thereby directly undercutting their earnings. Rather than passing a bill that will hurt drivers and riders, we welcome the opportunity to work together to create smart benefits that protect this important transportation option and earnings opportunity. Combined with protecting the independence and flexibility that drivers in Minnesota overwhelmingly support. Lyft has already offered to work with legislators and drivers on a thoughtful solution. We remain willing to do so, but this bill as introduced without stakeholder input is not the right starting point. 
Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Mr. Cocking, please. Mr. Answer. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Aaron Cocking, Insurance Federation of Minnesota. Thanks for the late addition and the chance to get up here and say a couple of quick, quick things. Uh, when we think about work comp insurance, we always kind of refer to it as the grand bargain between uh, employers and, uh, and labor. And there's a trade-off in that system. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I stepped out to make a call to one of the larger work comp carriers in the state to find out policies do not include independent contractors. Uh, and the reason, uh, as it was described to me, is that employers don't control the safety situation of independent contractors. They, they, they aren't around uh, to, to know the, the situations and to be able to set up kind of the policies uh, that you would have kind of from an, an, an employment perspective, the same way that you do in an independent contractor situation, and that's why they aren't, they aren't covered. Um, work comp is also very unique, and we spend a lot of time at the Work Comp Advisory Council and the legislature has done a lot of work in the work comp sphere to make sure that we have a work comp system that is functional in this state. There are not work comp like products as this bill describes in line 2.10 to 2.11. They just do not exist. Disability insurance might be the closest thing that you could potentially come close to associating with that, but they do not apply or generally don't apply to injured workers. So uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I just wanted to make sure that we got a couple of those points on the record. Thank you, Mr. Cocking. That's the end of our listed testifiers. And I just want to acknowledge that we did ask uh, Senator Fate to keep the testifiers to a minimum, and he respectfully did so. But there were many other people and or other organizations that would have liked to uh, testify in support of this bill. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we will go to member questions and comments. Sorry, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A question for Mr. Cocking. Does this product exist in Minnesota today? And I'm looking at Section 2 in the bill. Um, that talks about this workers' comp-like product. Is, is that something that if this law were to become implemented today, that, that this is a product that Uber or Lyft could go acquire in the market? Mr. Cocky. Mr. Chair, Senator Rasmussen, in, in the conversations that I've had, no. We, have, we, we are not aware of anything that's workers' comp like as we refer to chapter 176, which I would reiterate is, is, is the result of a lot of lengthy work that the legislature has done to create a functioning work comp system in the state. F follow up, Mr. Chair? Uh, Senator Rasmus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Follow-up question for Mr. Cocking. Um, it, is, it, is it possible that there wouldn't be an insurer that would be willing to write this type of policy given you know, the independent contractor status? And then follow-up is, do, do bills like this typically go to the workers' comp council that you talked about? Mr. Cocking. Mr. Chair, Senator Rasmussen, a couple of good questions. Um, I generally uh, am of the belief that insurers have, uh, if there's a demand in the market, you, you will have insurers that will find a way uh, to assess the risk and price for it. Uh, so I'm not going to say that there is, there is never going to be a product. I think the way that, and as complicated as work comp in Minnesota can be, it's not going to be something that's going to be readily available because as we try to identify, you know, what are the loss trends that we see? What, what, do, what do carriers expect to pay in losses? What are the risks associated with this? Some of that information is going to be a little more difficult to, uh, to ascertain. Uh, on the question as far as the Work Comp Advisory Council, this, this references Chapter 176 uh, and we're creating a Work Comp-like or, or theoretically a Work Comp-like product. I mean, I, I think the, the Work Comp Advisory Council always likes to see things that touch Work Comp. Senator Rasmussen, and also it looks as though Senator Frentz and uh, Mr. Cooper want to weigh in on this question as well, but uh, proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I guess so just a question for the bill author. Has this bill been to the Workers' Comp Advisory Council for their review and input? Senator Fate. No. Mr. Cooper. The thing I want to stress is, first of all, this doesn't require workers' comp. When it says work comp benefit, like benefits, it's con contrasting, and I actually had the case in the Court of Appeals where the Court of Appeals ruled a car, if you're shot or injured in a car, you get nothing from your car insurance. So all this is doing is making clear, Mr. we're not Cooper. talking car insurance Mr. Here. Cooper, we're talking address the president, please. I'm sorry? You address the chair, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I respond? Okay. Proceed. Oh, I forget where it was. But uh, one thing, as I said, and I have it, and you can look at it, what the uh, labor and industry says. Labor and industry says an uh, independent person can themselves or their employer, even if they're an independent contractor, can get uh, workers' comp insurance. We're not requiring that. 
I think, as was candidly uh, said by the other speaker, it is a situation where the product, if it's not currently here, would become available. I found the two speakers for Lyft, excuse me, for Uber contradicting each other. The first said, yes, occupational would be the right way to go, and the second said, no, you can't get that in Minnesota. I have no opinion as to which is correct. But this is not trying to require anybody to get workers' comp insurance. What it's requiring people to do is to cover if you get killed, if you get seriously injured, if you're not able to be employed. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess if it looks like workers' comp insurance and talks like workers' comp insurance, it might be workers' comp insurance. And I'm just concerned that this hasn't gone to the advisory council um, and that the language here is problematic in a few different ways. And, and another follow-up question I had for the bill author, Mr. Chair, is um, is it your intention, Senator Fate, that uh, you know, if this bill were to pass and become law, that Uber and Lyft drivers could still maintain their independent contractor status? Senator Fate. Yeah, yes, but I could also let... Yeah, the, the, the answer Cooper. is yes to that. Mr. Cooper, I'm, please address I'm sorry, the chair. Mr. Chair, I apologize again. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, they will be. There's absolutely nothing apart from vague and incorrect assertions that would affect their uh, their independent contractor status. That says that in the statute that we're passing that it will not affect it. It says it from what uh, the Department of Labor and Industry says. It says it what the criteria was. When the testifier for Uber was testifying, he was reading from the statute. Not It sounded like he was reading what you can't do as an independent contractor. That's not what he was reading. The terms that say what you have to be as an independent contractor are not affected by this. And if there's any ambiguity, the statute itself says it. And if there's still any ambiguity, labor and industry says it. So it doesn't have any impact on independent uh, being an independent contractor. Mr. Chair. Senator Rasps. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just would direct... Um, I guess I would just, from, from my reading of, of state statute, just disagree with, with the uh, testifier's assessment. I think if you look at section 176.043, uh, which outlines you know, what factors much, must be present to have independent contractors for uh, you know, this type of service, it very clearly states in paragraph two that the individual must be responsible for the maintenance of their equipment, yet in here we're providing for wear and tear, we're requiring uh, the TNCs to purchase vehicle equipment. Um, if we look at paragraph three, it says the individual must be responsible for operating costs, including fuel um, and vehicle insurance. Uh, fuel is, is covered in this bill. It specifically says in uh, 3.12 uh, that there must be 10 cents per mile for fuel or energy costs. Um, in addition, it talks about insurance. That's also required in this bill. We look at paragraph five, it talks about that independent contractors, it should not be on the basis of hours or time expended. If we look at the bill in line 2.22, 2.28, it talks about a minimum time requirement uh, under this bill. And so statute very clearly states what is required for independent contractor status. This bill puts in many places that would be requirements that would violate that statute. Um, and so, Mr. Chair, I, I just don't think this bill's ready, frankly. I think it's inconsistent with state statute. We're uh, talking about requiring insurance products that don't exist yet. Um, and I, I just don't think it's in the right interest of Minnesotans to move forward with this bill today. Senator Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Fate. First of all, you're fighting to make things better for drivers. And in my opinion, you are just the right person for that job. Um, thank and thank you for bringing this forward. And thank you to the testifiers. To the points about the statute, the independent contractor statute's important because it's a category of workers. So I think you got some work to do. And I would just put a couple things in front of you as you make your way forward. First of all, um, if we provide these benefits for this very important group of Minnesotans and they still fit the independent contractor statute, what will that mean for other working men and women who also fit the independent contractor statute? Um, you know, we wanna treat Minnesotans the same. We wanna lift up working men and women and if, for example, we provide benefits for the Uber and Lyft drivers, I, you know our job, Senator Fate, we will soon hear from other independent contractors who say, could we talk about the same benefits? So I look forward to working with you on that. I'd be happy to provide that as a lawyer stuck in the insurance regulations for 34 years, be happy to consult. And the second one I think is just as important, Senator Fate. Um, I think we all agree we want to improve working conditions, including driver safety. We all want that. 
if we provide insurance, if we provide additional benefits, someone's got to pay for that. And so, for example, to have Uber and Lyft pay for that is one alternative, but that will normally relate to an increase in cost, which means the consumer will pay part of it. And I encourage you to look at that question as to um, how much more that would be, how that would apply, and what is the appropriate, if it's okay to use this term, sweet spot, um, to try to provide these benefits and protections without, um, as one testifier put it, increasing the cost to a point where there are less drivers, less rides, that type of thing. Again, uh, Mr. Chair, I think Senator Fate is just the right person for this work, and obviously you have a lot more work to do, and I'm looking forward to observing from a safe distance. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Mr. Any Chair? Uh, sorry, any response, Senator Fate? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Cooper has a response. Mr. Cooper. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, a couple of things to point out. I, I agree wholeheartedly with your observation that we want to treat all Minnesotans the same. What we've done now is there's been this splintering that's been, that's been talked about a lot in the media where we have independent contractors, we have employees, and we have this group that Uber and Lyft are and uh, other people are. I think they're called gig workers, something of that nature, where essentially they have most of the characteristics of an employee, some of the characteristics of an independent contractor, but none of the protections that employees have. And as you pointed out, we have a situation where we want to treat all Minnesotans the same. When we have a person working for the same entity seven days a week for 10 years, and they get no protection despite being one of the most dangerous positions around, then that's not treating them the same. Some of the other gig workers are not facing the unique dangers that these workers are. And these are very, very different risks. But I agree with almost everything you said. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. We're going to wrap this bill up in about the next five minutes here. Uh, we have Senator Dames and then Senator Duckworth. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Fateh. Can you tell me, uh, this appears to be quite a controversial bill at this point. So I'm kind of surprised, to be honest with you, the bill is in front of us today that you haven't got more of this worked out with all the players. How long have you been working with the various players to try to get to an agreement on what should be and what's acceptable by both sides in this bill? Senator Fitte. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dames. Um, I would say at least the last eight or nine months we were working together. Um, even eight, nine months ago, we reached out to Uber and Lyft to, to bring them to the table. We reached out to different stakeholders. Um, a lot of the drivers, the overwhelming majority of the drivers uh, are with Molda. They're supporting um, the drivers while Murda is aligning with um, Uber. Um, you don't have to take my word for it. You can ask the folks behind me. How many of you are with the drivers today? So, 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 so Senator Fate, are you ahead. telling me that you based bringing this bill forward by the number of drivers there are and didn't bring all the people together to try to work it out? I'm not saying you're not on the right track. I'm just surprised that with the division there is here, why you're not bringing these people to the table and working it out. You say you've been doing it eight or nine months. Um, I've seen some of these things take a couple of years to get worked out, and that's not uncommon. Well, I really would like to see you take this back and get all the players at the table and get this worked out so that everybody could move forward with it. Everybody could survive in the industry. The drivers could make money so that they could survive. The industry could still survive. Uh, with the bill it is today, I don't see this industry surviving. So now what you're going to have is you may very likely have a lot of people that are no longer employed. Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Klein. I thank you for your concern, Senator Adams. The fact is we've been working with multiple stakeholders for eight or nine months to get this language correct. In fact, after the last committee hearing, uh, we've worked with our Republican colleague, Senator Dornick, to get uh, better language for this. We met with him, in fact, yesterday in our, in our, in our office. Um, originally, the bill had... Uh, a, a reimbursement rate of 255 per mile, um, up from 137, I believe. Um, Uber, other folks complained that that might be too high. So what we did is we went back and we adjusted it to be a dollar, I believe, a dollar 90. And when Uber first started, it was at a dollar 96 10 years ago. So we're still not at where we were 10 years ago, but we're trying to inch closer to at least get some more for our workers. These are folks that are working uh, seven days a week for them. So most, a lot of them are working seven days a week. Um, and they're struggling to make ends meet. So we're just trying to make sure that, A, we're, pr we're protecting our workers, but B, that they're getting um, uh, a, a quality wage. But I'll, I want Senator Cooper to also respond to part of it as well. 
Um, not Senator uh, Cooper. No, Stephen Cooper. Sorry, Mr. <laughs> Cooper. I apologize. Mr. Cooper. Th thank you. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, back in, I think, June, a letter was sent to Uber and Lyft that laid out exactly what the concerns were. Lyft responded Uber didn't, to the best of my knowledge. At least I never saw anything from them. Since then, we've met with the people from Chicago. We've met with the people from Illinois. We've met with the people from uh, Seattle, from Washington State, to discuss with them what was in their bill and why. As was just pointed out by the senator, this bill asked for less per, uh, per th th than they were paid eight years ago. Since eight years ago, the price they've been paying the drivers have been going down and down and down. And even when there was the huge peak in gas prices, they reduced the, the, the amount to the drivers. So when you say it's not ready yet, Uber yesterday said in a meeting they were refusing to negotiate. They were refusing to discuss. We have tried to meet with the other side, but we've, we've pared this down to the minimum that's required. And there is not anything in here that's fluff. There's not anything in here that's justified. And I do want to emphasize once again, this is a lower number than they actually were paid nine years ago. Senator Dames. You good? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have uh, one question. It's for Mr. Carlson. Um, and before I ask the question, I just want to acknowledge all the, the folks that were here to testify and the stories that they shared. Uh, very impactful, powerful. Hopefully there's something that we can do for you from a public safety standpoint, as well as some other things that we can do as a state to help you fight inflation and the rising cost of living. Um, I am an independent contractor. I own a couple of businesses, and we have relationships with independent contractors. And so my question for Mr. Carlson is, my understanding is you can't just pick or choose what your status is, whether you're an independent contractor and thereby get a 1099, or you're an employee and get a W-2. Law requires an employee status under certain circumstances. So, Mr. Carlson, in your opinion, would the circumstances being proposed in this bill cause TNC drivers like those of Uber or Lyft to likely be classified as W-2 employees per law, thereby subject, uh, subjecting them to the more stringent employee-employer relationship while also subjecting their pay to automatic state and federal taxes and also precluding them from claiming any of the deductions that they can as an independent contractor. Uh, Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Duckworth, we have two lanes in Minnesota. You can be an employee or you can be an independent contractor. This puts them clearly in the employee lane. No matter what they want to say, that as you know, Senator Rasmussen said, all the things in this bill take them out of being independent contractors. That's just on its face. And I mentioned, Mr. Chair, that I disagree with much of what Mr. Cooper said, and I won't chase every rabbit. But to suggest that we are not going to negotiate is completely untrue. And what I told him yesterday when, Sen when Senator Dornick invited me to a meeting, not these guys, Senator Dornick asked me to come to this meeting. I said, I'm not in a position to negotiate for all the players that are involved in this, including the local units of government that regulate us the other drivers uh, that you haven't even talked to, we, have, we operate in cities all across Minnesota that won't get service at all under this bill. And what I said, and I repeat, we're happy to, to sit down with everybody at the table. But on behalf of Uber, I'm not ready to speak for everyone else. And I can't negotiate for everyone. So that's what I said, and not that we would not negotiate, because that is nothing that I've ever brought to this legislature, as you well know. Senator Duckworth. Uh, Mr. Chair, the only thing I would add is I agree with many of the, the comments that were shared by Senator Frentz as it relates to independent contractors, and I think that should hopefully be well taken as this bill continues to be worked on. Thank you. Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question, I guess, for counsel. Um, there seem to be a number of issues here that are unresolved, at least, relating to insurance insurance questions, uh, 65B types insurance and workers' compensation insurance. And um, so I guess the real question is what committee has jurisdiction over those issues? Mr. Hudala. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Latz. I think that's a complicated question. 
because it turns on a couple different factors. Uh, the first being, as we've discussed, whether these individuals would be classified as independent contractors or as W-2 employees. Uh, there is a statute that Senator Rasmussen cited um, under which I think it would appear that they would no longer be classified as independent contractors. Um, that being said, I would note that that is for uh, trucking and courier messenger industry. And as far as I can tell, it's not clear that Uber necessarily falls within that particular statute. Um, whether someone's transporting people, I don't know if that uh, constitutes a courier. Um, that's something I would have to look into further. So that's kind of the first gating factor that would then go to determine whether workers' compensation is specifically required or not. Um, I think that question would probably be under the jurisdiction of labor. Uh, once the, you, know, you move past that determination as to insurance questions, workers' comp, what types of private insurance would be required um, under the specific language of the bill, I think that would be within Commerce Committee's jurisdiction. Mr. L Senator Latz. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's, it, it's, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I came in partway through the testimonial presentation. I apologize. I had some conflicting meetings. Uh, but from what I can tell, there are at least some issues that are um, not resolved, even on the face of it in this bill, that fall within this committee's jurisdiction and that, frankly, appear to have left the Labor Committee unresolved as well. Um, I can tell you right now the Judiciary Committee, if it goes there, is not going to resolve the issues that fall under this committee's jurisdiction or the Labor Committee's jurisdiction. Um, and I'm not comfortable voting to pass a bill that has unresolved issues on its face out of the committee of jurisdiction for those issues. Um, I'm just not. I think it's a bad practice in the legislature to do it. It happens all the time, and I've tried to do my best not to be a party to it. Because I'm not going to step on Commerce's jurisdiction. I don't expect Commerce to make judiciary-related decisions for that committee. Um, so I'm, I'm also troubled that there's a very clearly a very big gulf here between stakeholders. Um, this bill was introduced under a month ago. Um, and uh, actually two weeks ago. Uh, it is moving extraordinarily fast in a very complicated session as it is. So um, this is the kind of thing that I'm very concerned about moving along unfinished business in the legislative process, hoping that someone else is going to pick up the ball and fix it along the way. So right Fitty. now, that's my level of discomfort, Mr. Chairman. So Fitty. before, uh, I want to let Mr. Cooper speak first, but uh, I wanted to say that this, the reason why it was um, uh, introduced a little bit late, we've been working on the language for the last few months, um, working with different stakeholders, including uh, Uber and Lyft, and including the different drivers' associations. So once the language was finally finalized, that's when we sent it to the advisor's office. We didn't just drop it and then work it along the way. This took several months to get... Um, the wording as close as right as we could. Senator um, Friends. I'll let Senator Friends call. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Senator Fate. Again, you are the right person to move this forward, but I wonder if you would look favorably on a motion to table this. We would keep it in commerce where a lot of these issues go. You have my pledge to work with you on it, and I would hope other members of the committee on both sides of the aisle. I think your independent contractor definition issue certainly looks like it's commerce, and I, I think Senator Latz's point is a valid one. If we're doing our job as a committee and they give us an independent contractor issue, we got to hammer it out one way or the other. And so if Senator Fate would look favorably on that, Mr. Chair, I would be willing to bring a motion to table the bill and give us a chance to work on it. Senator Fate. Uh, I would say yes. Um, but the reason why also I wanted Mr. Cooper to speak is because he found some language in statute that might bring a little comfort. Uh, Senator Fate, I'll acknowledge Mr. Cooper, but I just want to make a couple comments from the chair. Um, yeah. I think that the concerns of the insurance industry that were raised, the concerns of Mr. Carlson that were raised, uh, the very <coughs> legitimate concerns of Senator Rasmussen uh, about um, uh, the worker status, 
are within the domain of this committee. And, and it is not fair, as Senator Latz says, for me to pass this on to judiciary without that work uh, being clearly defined. Uh, and candidly, a little more involvement of the stakeholders uh, on this bill. Uh, so I uh, uh, would be glad to listen to Mr. Cooper, and then I'm going to table the bill. Okay, I just have one uh, point here. 65 Mr. Pieces Cooper. Of, oh, I'm sorry. I, I keep goofing up, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chair, 65B2 already places the burden on either the TNC or the driver. There's, it, it can be either. So already in the law, that burden is already in the insurance statute in 62B, uh, subdivision 2, subsection 4. Uh, so the claim that somehow or other by doing what the statute that you've passed in the past already makes okay is somehow or other not okay is, I think, not solid. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. With that, Senate file 2319 as amended is tabled. Thank you for your time. You. Senator Mann. Welcome to the committee, Senator Mann. Senate File 328 is in front of us. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate File 328 will require increased drug pricing transparency, and most importantly, it will prohibit a plan from kicking patients off of their medications mid-year due to a formulary change. Drug formularies are a list of medications covered by a specific health plan. Formularies are the only aspect of a health plan that can be changed during the year. All other aspects of the Senator health Mann. plan... Order in the chamber. Senator Friends. Senator Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, like I was saying, formularies are the only aspect of a health plan that can be changed during the year. All other aspects of a health plan must remain stable from the beginning of the year. Some patients will sign up for a health plan specifically because it covers their specific medication. Formularies can change for several reasons. A newer, cheaper drug enters the market, so an older one gets taken off the formulary. A drug gets a generic, so the brand name is removed. However, what also occurs is the exact opposite. A new, more expensive drug takes the place of an older, cheaper one, or a brand name drug, which is more expensive, is put in place of a generic one. And this can occur for several reasons, including uh, because the pharmacy benefit manager or the PBM may get a larger kickback or rebate from the manufacturer. When a formulary does change, a patient will no longer have access to their medication. Patient will have to see their doctors for another prescription, will need to be monitored for new side effects, will need to be monitored to see if the new medication works for them, and they require blood work in order to do that. And when that new medication does not work, the patient suffers. This is a huge burden on patients, and it is a huge burden on their providers who have to start their treatment from square one. Sometimes we even kick patients off the medications that they have been taking for years. So what uh, Senate File 328 does is that it says a plan can change their formularies, but you cannot kick a patient off of their medications mid-year because the purpose of health care should be to make people healthy and not to make a profit. You might hear today that this is too restrictive and plans need to be able to change their formularies. So again, to be clear, they can change their formularies. You might hear today that it's the PBM's fault because the average wholesale price of drug does not include the PBM rebates. And the PBMs will say it's the manufacturer's fault uh, because the prices are too high or they're not, uh, or it's the distributor's fault even. Um, the point is we need price transparency at every level of the drug chain. And saying that if we, uh, require someone to offer their transparency, it's not gonna work, but that's not, 
entirely true because again, we need all the pieces of that puzzle. Um, so uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I do have uh, a testifier and I also have an amendment just to put that on your radar. Thank you, Senator Mann. I think this is your first stop, so this would be an author's amendment? Is no, this is my second. Oh, so okay. Yeah. So you have the A-Force. Uh, Senator uh, Seberger moves the A-3 amendment. Mr. Uh, Chair? I have an amendment to the A-3. Before we go to that, Senator Rasmussen, uh, Senator Seberger moves the A-3. Senator, Senator Mann, can you describe the A-3? Um, so the A3 um, just changes on page 14, line 17, it changes quarter to year, so we keep the plans similar, the commercial as well as the state. Um, and then it just clarifies that currently the state plans are changing their formularies quarterly um, because the federal rebate that CMS uses to pay for pharmacy services occurs quarterly, so we're saying they can continue doing that practice that they are currently doing, they just can't kick the patients off their medications. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A4 amendment to the A3 amendment, and I'm happy to describe it. Senator Rasmussen moves the A4 as an amendment to the A3. Please describe the A4. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the conversations with the bill author on this. The amendment to the amendment simply adds in health plan companies um, and make sure that between public plans and private plans that they're on the same playing field uh, when it comes to the A3 amendment. Senator Mann. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, so right now the commercial plans can change their formularies whenever they want. So by saying that they can change it, they, up, they can update their preferred dr drug list only quarterly that restricts their movement. I don't honestly understand why they want this, but I have no problem with it if... Senator Raspin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank the bill author. And yeah, I've uh, talked with the health plans on this, and they feel like this uh, amendment on this specific thing would give them a little bit more of an even playing field with the uh, public plans. And so I'd ask for members to support the amendment to the amendment and appreciate uh, Senator Mann. Members, we're voting now on the A4 amendment to the A3 amendment, which the author uh, has accepted as a friendly amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The A4 is adopted to the underlying A3. Member questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, the A3 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The A3 as amended by the A4 is adopted. Uh, member or testifiers. Uh, let us go to Dr. Roli Duivetti and Bentley Graves to the table, please. Welcome to the committee, Dr. Duivetti. Please introduce yourself and proceed. I'm Roli Duivetti, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Roli Duivetti, a family physician practicing in Minneapolis, and I'm here representing the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians and the Minnesota Medical Association in a strong support of SF328. As a physician, my first goal is to work with my patients to determine what is the optimal treatment for them and what is optimal for their health. As a family physician, I have many patients who have multiple chronic conditions where the treatment can last for many years or for lifelong, like the patients with diabetes, hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, mental illness, and many more. For these patients, it's very critical that we find the right treatment and we keep them on that right treatment so that their health conditions remains controlled and does not worsen. There is nothing more enraging and frustrating that when I have a patient who I have stabilized on a medication that is working for them, and I hear that the insurer or the PBM has changed its formulary, forcing my patient to change from the medication that has been working. Why should an insurer or PBM be able to force my patient to change drugs when the PBM decides to no longer cover the drug that has been working? My patient also cannot choose to go to another health plan until the end of their enrollment year. For many conditions, changing from one to drug to another drug in the same class, that can work. But for certain conditions like severe persistent mental illness, epilepsy, even diabetes, other, or, or the other changing medication mid-treatment can put patient at a severe risk. You will sometimes hear that these changes are done in the name of saving cost, 
But if a patient cannot get an inhaler that I see a lot in a timely manner, they end up into the emergency room and that increases the total cost of care for the patient and for also for the system. SF328 does not prohibit PABMs from changing their formularies throughout the year. They can always add new drugs when they believe there is a benefit. They can always add a new generic when it comes available. They can also always add new drugs that may be more cost effective for a patient. But, but what this bill would prohibit is forcing a patient to switch drug from once they have started a therapy that has originally covered by the PBM until the end of the patient's enrollment year. You also need to know the dam damage and the cost these formulary changes barriers are having on physicians, clinical entities, and other prescribers. In most clinics today, there are administ administrative staff which are devoted to do this sole job where they are spending hours and hours on the phone talking with the PBMs and insurers appealing for these medical decisions which are made by someone, not by the prescri prescriber or by the clinician. And they are trying to understand why the medication was changed and trying to convince them to, that the decision was not in the best interest of the patient. While we are successful many times in getting an appeal, but care is delayed for the patient and administrative cost and the hassle is being added. So uh, with this testimony, I ask you to strongly support the SF328 and thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, doctor. And as you clear the table, could Christina Moorhead please come forward? Mr. Graves, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair members. Bentley Graves from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, I'll start by by just kind of reflecting on the uh, the amendment that uh, that was made to the bill. You know, as this bill came into committee, it set two different standards uh, for public programs and for commercial health plans, uh, and gave public programs more leeway in making changes to the formulary throughout the year, uh, which is, uh, for better or worse, a, a cost saving mechanism. Um, this this amendment now puts both commercial plans and public programs on the same uh, on the same playing field. Uh, and to some extent, we're, we're grateful for that because um, it hopefully will give us some sense of the cost implications of this move. We have, as this bill has been brought forward in previous years, have, have had fiscal notes from, uh, from CGIP on the implications of this bill. Uh, it has rarely applied to, to public programs uh, equally uh, as it has equally to commercial programs in the past. And so we haven't always gotten a great sense of of, uh, of what that cost might be if, if applied to the public programs. Uh, but hopefully going forward now, we will, we will have some sense of that. And the reason why I, I raise that is because, again, historically, we have seen cost considerations with this move, which is something that has, has uh, brought concern to us on behalf of our members. Um, and we, we, our sense is certainly that there will be cost considerations going forward, but, but our hope is that now that this applies equally to both, we will get a better sense of that um, by looking at the implications both to, to CGIP and to public programs since we don't have a great way to kind of measure the cost impact of, of changes like this to commercial plans. So um, just want to mostly put a pin in that cost conversation today um, as we look forward to this bill moving forward and, and hopefully getting a better sense of, of what this means from a cost standpoint. But appreciate the opportunity to, to offer that feedback. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Graves. And as you clear the table, could Michelle Mack please come forward? Ms. Moorhead, please introduce yourself and proceed. Chairman Klein, members of the committee, my name is Christina Moorhead, and I'm here today representing the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, or Pharma. We represent the country's leading innovative biopharmaceutical research companies. Um, in the interest of time, I will just say we support Article 2. Um, in your handouts, we provided a full statement that has legal issues and other concerns with it. But I'd like to spend my time today talking about two issues. We hope to work with Senator Mann and others um, on this committee to make the, make the bill more workable for our brand drug manufacturers. So Article 1, Section 7, Subdivision 4, that's the top of page 7, uh, allows drug manufacturers to increase the wholesale acquisition cost of a drug for the next calendar year, only if 90 days notice is given. The next calendar language is problematic for our drug manufacturers because drug manufacturers contract with many health plans who have varying start and end dates of the contracts with their plan sponsors. And two, a drug manufacturer price increase may occur um, at any point during the calendar year. So we would request that this language be changed that a drug manufacturer gives 90 days notice prior to the effective date of a price increase but is not tied to a calendar year. 
Our second concern is that there's no confidentiality language for the information provided in an advanced price notification. The Federal Trade Commission has acknowledged that disclosure of competitively sensitive information could undermine beneficial market forces within the industry. So advanced notice and other disclosure requirements could have the opposite effect of, opposite of their intended effect and undermine competitive bidding in the marketplace. In addition, advanced notification of WAC price increases creates financial incentives for secondary distributors to enter the pharmaceutical supply chain, creating a gray market. Gray market distribution networks consist of a number of different companies, some doing business as pharmacies, some are distributors, and they buy and they resell medicines to each other before one finally sells the drug to a hospital or another healthcare facility. As the medicines are sold from one secondary distributor to another, the possibility of counterfeit medicines infiltrating the supply chain increases, and it can also increase the cost for hospitals in those healthcare facilities. So we would ask that the confidentiality protection language be added to protect advanced price notification information submitted by the drug manufacturers until the price is effective. And then on the date the price becomes effective, the state may then publish information as required under Article 1, Section 3, Subdivision 6 of the bill. Uh, we believe these changes protect the competitively sensitive information against gray market distribution and does not change the intent of this bill. Uh, Chairman Klein, I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mack, please introduce yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Klein, Chair Klein and members of the committee. My name is Michelle Mack, and I'm a Senior Director of State Affairs at the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, otherwise known as PCMA. PCMA is the National Trade Association that representing America's Pharmacy Benefit Managers, or PBMs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in Senate File 328. While we recognize and appreciate Senator Mann's good intention to create a balanced bill, we must respectfully oppose Senate File 328. We believe this bill will restrict our ability to utilize an important management tool and help keep drugs more affordable for patients and payers. We appreciate Senator Mann's use of a non-severability clause in the bill as it points to the ongoing challenge of addressing ever-increasing prescription drug costs in the context of formulary changes. However, there still is a cost. A report by Milliman, which I submitted um, and should be in your packets, shows that this type of policy would cost Minnesota healthcare payers $75 million over five years, and the state's own analysis on this issue in prior years substantiates this. Unfortunately, the state does not have the authority to limit what pharmaceutical manufacturers charge. PBMs help provide their members access to safe, effective, and affordable medications, but pricing in the drug market is volatile, and there are very few tools to incent drug manufacturers to reduce prices formulary placement, and financial incentives to use lower cost generics and brand alternatives are among those tools. This bill threatens these cost savings mechanisms. Formularies are created by a PBM's Pharmaceutical and Therapeutics Committee, or P&T Committee, which conduct a thorough and detailed clinical review of FDA-approved drugs and recommendations on whether the drug should be included in the plan's formulary. After this clinical review, the lowest net cost of the drug determines where the drug will be placed on the formulary or if it will be placed there. For a vast majority of patients, a formulary change to therapeutically equivalent alternative brand or generic drug has no clinical impact. However, we recognize it can have an impact in rare instances, and for this reason, there are appeals processes which health plans and PBMs have in place for patients to access a non-formulary drug where medically, medically necessary and or likely to create the best clinical outcome. We believe our appeals processes are fair and responsive. In closing, PCMA believes that Senate File 328 will raise prescription drug costs as it removes important tools that PBMs use to deliver high-quality services to their clients and ultimately patients. Thank you for your time and consideration. Well, thank you, Ms. Mack. Uh, and before we go to member comments, um, uh, the next stop for this bill is at the Health and Human Services Committee, but I've confirmed with counsel that our jurisdiction actually pertains to the entire bill here uh, as it regulates health insurance company behavior. Uh, member questions or comments? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so just to be clear, this bill is the, the, the next stop would be going back to Health and Human Services? Uh, we're send, Senator Rasmussen, we're sending it back to Health and Human Services. Senator Rasmussen. I had one question, um, Mr. Chair, for the bill author. And, you know, it's my understanding that this bill effectively has price controls on um, drug manufacturers and on drugs. And this committee, I believe it was, it was a number of weeks ago, but we had a, 
uh, bill that was similar that was basically a, adjusted because of a court case that said that brand name drugs, uh, given the, the federal protection that they have over their intellectual property, that the state can't basically stop price changes. And so just wanted to see, Mr. Chair, if the bill author had any comment on that. Um, and I would just add that I appreciate in this bill there's actually, uh, it's, it's not severable. And so if the court strikes down one aspect of this, uh, it would all go down. And I actually think that's a good feature in this bill, but wanted to see if the bill author could talk about potential questions over the constitutionality of, of uh, banning price increases or putting limits on that. Senator Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this bill doesn't ban anything. Um, and so there was similar bills in other states. And th I mean, this is like legal mumbo jumbo, which I cannot accurately describe to you. But the purpose of the non sever or the severability clause is because in order for us to do what we're doing in the bill, it has to be both brand and generic drugs. So that's why one was not singled out versus the other. And as long as we create a nexus in the state of where all that activity is happening, then it would be legal. And again, I can't describe it any better than that because I'm not a lawyer, but um, that's all I got for you today. <laughs> Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that. Uh, Senator Mann, I'm also not an attorney and so can get uh, lost in that sometimes as well. Um, and I would just say, you know, I have a few concerns about the bill and, and just, you know, is it actually gonna work as intended and what are some of the implications? And I, again, I think uh, I'll make the same comment I've made on other bills that I think I've tried to control changes in, you know, prescription drug pricing or in this case with the formulary. Um, I think it's really tough for the state of Minnesota on our own to do that. And I think there haven't really been states who have done that successfully uh, that I know of. And so I just worry that this, this bill isn't going to be able to be functional if it gets passed into law. I appreciate the conversation today. Senator Rasmussen. Before I go to mute, uh, other member comments, uh, I should have asked for public testifiers. It looks as though we have one. Mr. Selwood, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Klein and members of the committee. My name is Joe Selwood, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Association for Accessible Medicines, the leading trade association for the manufacturers of generic and biosimilar medicines. There's a letter from AAM in your packet that outlines their opposition to, to Senate File 328. Through the use of generic and biosimilar medicines, Minnesotans saved $5.3 billion in 2021, and generic drugs are 91% of drugs dispensed, but only 18% of the total cost of prescription drugs. This is because a generic drug is often produced by multiple manufacturers who compete against each other to sell their product to wholesalers at a national and global market. Generic manufacturers are not part of the problem Senate File 328 is trying to solve and should not be included. A patient is often unaware of which generic manufacturer made their drug because they are intended to be the same regardless of which manufacturer produced it. This is why formulary, formulary decisions are not based on selecting one generic manufacturer over another and patient out-of-pocket costs are not based on the WAC price of an individual manufacturer. Senate File 328 requires a manufacturer to report each drug with a wholesale acquisition cost of $100 or more, and the state will publicly post that information. For generic drugs with multiple manufacturers, patients will find a list of prices for the same drug that can have wide variations. This will simply cause confusion, particularly if one manufacturer reports a high WAC price, while other manufacturers of the same drug are much lower. Further, neither the reporting or the posting of this information will lower the price of prescription drugs. Most concerning, though, are the new price controls implemented when a drug is reported under Subdivision 2 and if that drug is placed on a drug formulary. Virtually every generic will be because they are lower cost than the brand drug. Implementing price controls on transactions between manufacturers and wholesalers in other states raises significant legal concerns. It's unclear how this applies to the, to the competitive generic market. If one manufacturer reports a drug under subdivision two, but there are multiple manufacturers of the same drug that have dramatically lower prices, are they forced to comply with the same requirements as the one with the higher cost? Will the annual price lock and advance notice requirement reply to all generic manufacturers of the drug regardless of their price? It should also be considered that, wholesale, that the wholesalers who determine where the drug product is shipped, uh, these price controls could apply to generic drugs not even sold in Minnesota. 
Generic and biosimilar medicines are manufactured and sold in a market that works and provides significant cost savings to Minnesotans. Adding layer upon layer of reporting and price controls will not lower the price of drugs and will eventually have the opposite effect. For those reasons, AAM opposes Senate File 328. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Selwood. Member you. questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, so uh, closing comments, Senator Mann. Um, not really, uh, Mr. Chair. <laughs> uh, again, the bill is, uh, you know, we're asking for, for manufacturers um, and pharma to, to list their wholesale acquisition prices. And it's correct, it's not what the, the uh, patient will pay at the market, but that's, that price is directly tied to that. And so again, this is about transparency. What is that price? And every testifier you heard today said, we don't want to do that, essentially. We don't want to give you that price. We don't want to put those numbers out there, right, for many reasons, uh, none of which, uh, in my opinion, are good reasons because that transparency is what we're lacking, and that's why everything is so convoluted and drug prices are completely out of control. And the formulary piece, again, you can change the formulary. You're welcome to change the formulary. Do what you need to do uh, for, for drug containment, but you cannot, and that's all the bill does, you cannot take a patient off of their drugs mid-year when they specifically, especially when they specifically signed on to that health plan for that medication. Well, thank you, Senator Mann. Um, having heard that, the question is on the motion of Senator Wickland that Senate File 328 is amended, be recommended to pass, and re refer to the Committee on Health and Human Services. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Mann. Members, we have 10 minutes left, and I do not want to rush the next bill. Um, we will be returning tonight at 5.30 p.m. Uh, to do the remainder of the agenda. Uh, so we will recess at this time until 5.30 p.m. <laughs>